Hey everyone, Sumo Spiffy here. If you've been around the channel for a while, you might recall we did a video a while back about ways to implement time off for sumo wrestlers so they could deal with serious injuries. There will be a link to it in the description. The idea was that they shouldn't have to choose between the risk of coming back too soon or plummeting to the bottom of the bonzuke. It was partially prompted by the conversations that grew from Wakataka Kage blowing out his ACL in March 2023, and between that video and now, we also watched Hakuoho explode onto the scene and then drop right back out to fix his shoulder. Both of them made it back to Jurio in this most recent tournament, but while plenty of people assumed they would run the whole division, they struggled significantly more than expected. So it's worth asking, what should we really expect from these guys in the future as they recover from these particular injuries? Let's start with Wakataka Kage. This is a guy who made it to the top division two and a half years after his debut at the bottom of Division 4. He hurt his ankle in his first top division tournament, dropped back to Jurio briefly, but then spent two and a half years in Makauchi with only two losing records along the way. When he was promoted to Sekiwake in March 2022, he looked like a very good wrestler who couldn't score the kind of records necessary to make an Ozeki run. But he won that tournament, and immediately the Ozeki talk started. He went back to mostly 8-7 and seven and 9-6 and six records after that, before tearing his ACL on day 13 of March 2023. After three Bashos off, then two Makushita tournaments, including a Yusho in January, he returned to Jurio this past March and won his first seven matches before finishing 2-6 and six over the last eight days. So, in sum, we're looking at a guy who was a solid Sekiwake and didn't appear too vulnerable to losing the rank before his injury. Given his history and his 18 consecutive wins before hitting the skids, it looked like the expectations of a rampage were well founded. The first question then is did it look like something went wrong with his knee when he started losing? Sometimes this sort of thing is obvious. If you saw any of Koto Echo's matches in January or March, you know what I'm talking about. Here's a quick breakdown of his losses. Chiyo Sakai hit him on the tachi eye, slid to the side, and pushed him down. It was a good move and nothing that could really say much about Waka's injury, at least on its own. Daishoho did something very similar. He held Waka up on the tachi eye, blocking down on his left arm and getting his left hand around the back of Waka's right arm as Waka pushed against him. Then he swiveled and pulled down. Again, it was a good move and nothing looked clearly wrong with Waka, but it did create the question of how much mobility he actually has in his right knee or if he's lacking some power to stop bigger guys from being able to set up these moves. The fight with Mitoryu was a lot more interesting. Waka was able to move and spin as necessary, so his mobility looked fine. And not being able to push a guy like Mitoryu, I mean, Mitoryu's enormous, as is Daishoho. If you could fault Waka's health in some way for this loss, it looked like he simply didn't have the leg strength to withstand what Mitoryu wanted to do in the way we might expect. Given that those losses were against much bigger guys, I thought Waka would run over Asakoryu, but Asa got his arm encircled away towards his injured knee before pulling him down. Again, nothing obvious stood out as a problem with the knee. Waka's left leg, the healthy one, got way out of control, which could happen if he simply underestimated Asakoryu's strength and pulling power. It looked like he assumed he could keep up with anything Asa did, and whether for reasons of health or strategy, he couldn't. He put up a fight against Oshoma, Oshoma just beat him. Not a sentence I'd ever expect to say, but it's true. Once again, it's possible he lacked the power that he needed to get a final push on Oshoma, but mostly Oshoma just kept up with what he could do. He took that match from Waka and I hate giving Oshoma credit for anything. And then Shishi. With everyone else who beat Waka besides Chiyo Sakai, we're talking about guys with at least marginal top division ability. Daishoho and Mitoryu have been there, Oshoma's going up in May, and the only thing stopping Asakoryu so far is his size, which is less of a problem against Waka. But Shishi's not on that level, and yet, after Waka looked like he was gonna dominate, Shishi got him under the arm and heaved him over the leg in a big throw that got Waka off balance enough for Shishi to finish the fight. If I had to guess, it looked like the kind of fight Waka would have won if he was still on a roll, but he was losing to guys he knows he should wreck. When that happens in any sport, it's easy to lose track of fundamentals, and when matches are over so fast, one slip like that can get you beat. The most important thing here is that the knee looked sturdy. He never gimped around on it, it never looked like it was creating an issue or that he had more trouble using his right leg than his left for some reason. It wouldn't be surprising at all to find out he hasn't built his lower body strength up to its pre-injury level, or that he started to run out of gas because he hadn't fought 15 days in a year. His performance, though, left no serious cause for concern. Next Basho, he'll still be in Jurio and he should be fine. There's no reason to think he won't get at least 10 wins. But think about that expectation. Guys in the second division aren't bad by any means, but this is still way below his expected level. If you're familiar with Waka's career pre-injury, 
10 wins this past Basha would have seemed low, and yet now it seems chancy to predict anything more. We still have no idea what the odds are that he'll reach his previous heights, and the eyeball test, which is frequently all we have to go on when gauging injuries in sumo athletes, isn't good enough. It only really works when the problem is obvious. I mean, it turns out Kirishima was rocking not one, but four injuries in March, his neck, back, and both elbows, and no one could tell what was wrong. So I started reading. The main concern to me, and probably a lot of you, is whether or not wrestlers with these kinds of injuries push or are pushed to come back too soon, and thus this paper, with the subtitle How Fast Is Too Fast, got my attention. By the way, links to all papers used as sources will be in the description. This paper compares a conservative model of treatment for ACL recovery versus an accelerated approach. Briefly, conservative treatment involves long-term immobilization and, in this paper, is defined as returning to sport after nine months or later and basing criteria for certain tasks on time rather than objective testing. Even without knowing Wakataka Kage's exact rehab plan, since he was back competing in Makushita after six months, and yeah, Makushita is only half the matches but it's still full contact, we can safely say they didn't use a conservative protocol. An accelerated program includes early unrestricted motion, immediate weight bearing as tolerated, eliminating immobilizing braces, and a patient-dependent aim to return to high-level physical activities or sport within six months post-operatively. Again, even without a lot of news regarding Waka's recovery arc, it seems like his rehab must have followed this sort of pattern. So how do the outcomes for accelerated recovery compare to more conservative treatment? Overall, this study found there wasn't much difference. First, any increase in knee laxity, which is essentially knee pain caused by loose ligaments, was not significantly different two years post-op between the conservative and accelerated groups. Patients were able to recover strength earlier in an accelerated program, showing significantly better strength at six months, but no real difference after nine months. Quadricep strength and symmetry were higher in the accelerated group, but not by a statistically significant margin. Another cited paper tested quadricep and hamstring strength at different points in recovery and also found no significant difference between the groups. In short, those of us who were concerned about this being too quick of a turnaround for Waka to come back, and I was one of them, should take this data as a major positive. Nothing indicates that a slower approach would have improved things for him, and he wasn't rushed back faster than normal using this criteria-based accelerated approach. The only potential reason for concern might be if he wasn't meeting the regular criteria for returning to action but still got back in the ring, but right now there's no reason to think that's the case. Alright, everything seems to have been handled correctly, but we're still trying to figure out his likely long-term outcome with a reconstructed ACL. So the next thing I looked for was information on ACL tears specifically in pro sumo wrestlers. I only found one paper which dealt with this, and it discussed rates of re-injury among Rikishi with ACL tears at the Fraternity Memorial Hospital in Sumida City, Japan. This covers 255 wrestlers diagnosed with ACL injuries between 1988 and 2015. The paper was written in 2020, which was enough time to see what happened with everyone. It focuses on outcomes for wrestlers who suffered a second ACL injury, whether to the same knee or the opposite one, after having ACL reconstruction on the first injury, and it compares outcomes between those who had another surgery for the second injury and those who didn't. It would have been much more helpful to find a study on outcomes for wrestlers recovering from their first ACL injury, because in this case now we're only looking at a group of 22 guys, and it's hard to draw conclusions from that. Still. Looking at what's here, the most relevant detail with regards to achieving the same level of performance was the comparison in rank two years after the injury between the group that had the second injury fixed with surgery and those who stayed more conservative. For our purposes, the comparison doesn't really matter because Waka had the surgery and there wasn't a reasonable option to do otherwise. We just need to look at the group that had surgery, which is the red line. The wrestlers with an ipsilateral injury, which means an injury on the same side, and had surgery were, on average, at the top of Jonidon. Two years later, they were about halfway up in Sandanme. Those who had a contralateral injury, or an injury on the opposite knee, and had it surgically fixed were, on average, near the bottom of Sandanme. Two years later, they had a small increase in rank on average. At a glance, it might look like this suggests someone who gets ACL reconstruction should be fine, but there are a couple of key details that make this less relevant to Wakataka Kage. For one, even if we ignore the small sample size, the average age of these wrestlers was 21.6 if they had an ipsilateral re-injury and 23.8 if they had a contralateral ACL injury. At a younger age, improvement as a wrestler and thus an increase in rank is likely for anyone injured or otherwise. There's no way to know if they truly had a full recovery or if the injury held them back overall, but they were able to improve enough to overcome the injury's effects. 
In addition, wrestlers hovering around the Division 4 and 5 border are not really elite athletes. You don't have to be a perfect physical specimen or anything close to it to compete at that level. Someone with a reconstructed ACL could have reduced capacity, but still more than enough ability to do okay at that level as their experience grows, and that growth is more likely if they're relatively young. There's far less room for error at the top of the Banzuke. That means we still need information on how this affects very high-level athletes. A number of studies track this across sports, but obviously every sport is different and has different requirements of its athletes. If there's little information about these injuries in sumo wrestlers, then we need a comparable sport with more relevant research. The best option, at least to me, is American football. And that leads us to this paper, Return to Play and Performance After ACL Reconstruction in NFL Players. Where most papers I found about ACL injuries focused on return to play rates, this one explicitly states it's using an approximate value algorithm to compare performance across positions and over time. This study analyzed 135 NFL athletes who were injured sometime from 2013 to 2018, had sufficient performance data from before their injury, and came back to play in the league again. The initial group of 312 was split up by position. These are the stats of who returned to play and who didn't. So now we have a question to answer. Which positions are most analogous to sumo? The obvious answers are offensive and defensive linemen. To this I would add running backs, since their job relies on staying low and nimble, which applies to a lot of sumo wrestlers and definitely Wakata Kakage. We can probably add linebackers as well. They frequently burst forward over short distances to hit a target, and like running backs need to make quick cuts but on a larger frame. Not all return to play statistics are helpful, but these should be because the NFL is a competitive league. It's probable that most of the guys who didn't return to play were simply not able to earn their way back onto the field as opposed to choosing to call it a career, which indicates a drop in performance. So it's not a great starting point to see that nearly half the running backs, defensive linemen, and linebackers never played again. The only group that mostly returned to play was the offensive linemen. However, it's possible that in some of these cases, the players were able to return to form after an extended period, but were already out of the league and didn't have a route back in. Pro Sumo isn't stopping Wakata Kakage from competing, so if returning to full strength is possible but will take a while, he has that time as long as he doesn't get hurt again. So let's move on to performance analysis. The AV methodology created by the researchers allocated points according to team performance, then assessed players based on their function within the team. They ran these ideas through a couple of tests I know nothing about and landed on the primary outcome measures for performance being AV and snap count, since presumably players who can't do as well will see the field less often. If the AV concept seems out there, I liken it to war, wins above replacement, which is most commonly used in baseball. It's an attempt to create a single metric that quantifies what a player brings to the field. Even if their calculations miss something, it'll miss it for everyone, so any variance between positions should still be relevant. These two charts show the change in AV and snap count from before the players were injured to three years after their surgeries. Overall, there was a 41.7% decrease in AV and a 49.6% decrease in snap counts during those first three years. That's a big drop, but it's not the thing that gets my attention the most here. On these charts, the X is the mean, the average, and the line is the median. Before their injuries, the mean and the median are fairly close on both charts, which means there was close to the same number of players above and below the average. But after surgery, both charts show a median far below the average. That means there were a lot more guys below the average than above it, and the guys at the top did a lot of heavy lifting to drag the average up. To put it another way, some guys did keep working at a high level, or at least a high level relative to this set of players, but more of them fell off, weren't as effective, and weren't able to see the field as often. Furthermore, the average AV was 4.3 pre-injury and 1.5 post-injury, averaged across three seasons pre- and post-injury. That's a difference of 2.8. Of course, you'd expect a bigger gap in the first season post-injury, but for the guys in the league three years after their injury, the AV was still two points less than the season before injury. This suggests that very few players, if any, were able to genuinely return to their pre-injury performance levels. When we break it down by position, things look even worse. Receivers and quarterbacks, positions as disconnected from sumo as any outside of maybe the kickers, returned closest to their pre-injury snap count. On the flip side, running backs and defensive linemen, two of our core comparison groups, had snap count drop-offs of 83.5% and 73.2%. Linebackers were next worst at 58.6%. 
Decreases in AV mostly correlated with decreases in snap count. Running backs were worst again with a fall off of 90.5%, defensive linemen second at 76.2%, and linebackers third at 62.5%. With both metrics, offensive linemen seemed to avoid the worst of it, although they still suffered a 35.7% decrease in snap count and a 27.4% decrease in AV. In fact, our four comparison groups had the four biggest drops in AV of any position set. All of that looks really bad, and yet there's one more detail which piles on further with respect to Wakataka Kage. In the discussion section of the paper, the authors mention that it remains a question why NFL players consistently perform worse after ACL reconstruction. They point out that multiple studies have shown players with concomitant chondral and meniscal injuries have a worse performance level and shorter career longevity than players with just an ACL reconstruction. And Waka did injure his meniscus alongside the ACL tear. If you want to hold out some hope, it is just one paper and there are always exceptions to the rule. Most papers aren't accessible in full though, and I could only find abstracts to work with. Those tended to say similar things, at least when accounting for positional differences. For example, this 2005 paper concludes that running backs and wide receivers who sustain ACL injury return at some point, but performance is reduced by one third. Obviously, that's from quite a while ago, and even though Japan often seems a bit behind the times in terms of how they deal with these types of injuries, they're still almost certainly ahead of how ACL tears were treated around the turn of the century. But I couldn't find anything that said the opposite of what was here. The most positive research about ACL tears in NFL players talked about quarterbacks. I like Waka's style, and I hope he's able to return to the level he was at before his injury. He might end up being an incredible outlier like Adrian Peterson, who tore his ACL at the end of the 2011 NFL season. The very next year, he won MVP and Offensive Player of the Year, and followed up by making the All-Pro teams in 2013 and 2015. But in the cold light of data, covering dozens of similar athletes, it doesn't seem like Waka's a favorite to do so. I have no doubt he'll return to Makauchi, and he might even pop off in his first tournament back. I would call it a big success though if he makes it back to the Sanyaku at all, much less if he's able to stick there as a regular again. Now let's talk about Hakuoho. The young gun came into pro sumo with a bad shoulder, and it got worse over his three professional tournaments until surgery could no longer be put off. There was no specific explanation of what his injury entailed, but going by descriptions of what happened to him and the planned surgery, it sounds like he had arthroscopic surgery to fix a torn labor. If you've ever heard of a slap tear, it's important to note that this is probably not what happened to Hakuoho. A slap tear involves the top of the labrum, where it connects to the biceps tendon. The front, the back, or both sides of the labrum up top may need repair. However, it's entirely possible to tear the whole thing, or have partial tears anywhere on the labrum. That more severe type of injury is when you start to get random shoulder dislocations, which is something Hakuoho said in interviews he had to deal with. In addition, the official reason for him skipping the September Basha was subluxation of the shoulder, which is a fancy medical term for partial dislocation. Unfortunately, finding data which directly points to how athletic performance in this type of sport is affected after surgery for such an injury is almost impossible to find. A huge proportion of such research revolves around baseball players, and to a lesser extent athletes in other sports that involve a lot of throwing and swinging the arm like volleyball. With respect to contact sports, the information available generally reflects how common the injury is and return to play statistics, but the return to play statistics aren't nearly as useful as the ones from the ACL study. That's unfortunate, because as the authors point out in this paper on shoulder labrum injuries in college football players, they found linemen and linebackers, most of our main comparisons between football players and sumo wrestlers, had the highest rates of such injuries. Furthermore, a different study reported similar findings, and those authors believed this was due to blocking techniques that involved punching and blocking with the arms forward flexed, adducted, and internally rotated. You could describe a lot of movements in sumo wrestling in a similar way. Thus, performance data on those players could be extremely useful. But there is some data we can piece together to at least create an educated guess. For example, even though a slap tear isn't what happened to Hakuoho, it's worth noting that this data on players drafted with and without a slap repair wound up with essentially equal performance scores, and the career length of those with slap repairs was nearly the same as those without. It's also worth noting that the number of games started and played by those with slap repairs was noticeably lower. The groups in this study are quite small, which necessarily means we can't draw too many conclusions from it, 
but a rough takeaway might be that the players who see the field are able to perform up to par, but it's less likely someone with a slap repair will earn regular playing time. This becomes more likely when considering that linemen, especially offensive linemen, tend to play every down, and someone who can't handle being in on every play may not see the field at all. It's a little different with sumo, since Hakuoho can keep walking out there without being at full strength, but it suggests that as long as he recovers fully, he should have the same athletic capability as before his injury. Other research is even more limited. One paper, Professional Athlete Return to Play and Performance After Shoulder Arthroscopy Varies by Sport, looked perfect when I saw they included NFL players. Unfortunately, only eight NFL players fit their criteria, so even though those players showed improvement after surgery, it's too small a sample for that to mean anything. Another paper showed an extremely high rate of return to play for college football players after arthroscopic shoulder surgery, but on its own that doesn't mean much. If you're a kid in that position, you have to at least try and get out there to keep your scholarship. The statistic that 91% of starters return to a starting role, however, is a lot more meaningful. Given the drop-off in performance we saw at some positions after ACL reconstruction, it seems very likely that, at minimum, players who undergo shoulder surgery are more consistently able to reach a level of performance comparable to what they had pre-injury. Even if a school doesn't kick a kid off the team when they get hurt, they're not generally going to start him if he's not the best option. So this is also good if you're looking for evidence that Hakuoho will return to his pre-injury form. This paper, however, got my attention. First, it showed 92.8% of players who experience shoulder instability will return to play. If you look up shoulder injuries in NFL players, you'll find plenty of headlines about specific players saying they've played with injured shoulders for years. Considering some shoulder injuries can be mitigated by strengthening the muscles around the joint to keep it in place, that's not too surprising. Likewise, players who had a surgical repair were much less likely to have instability again, and if it did happen, it took longer to occur. But there was also this little detail. Players who had a partial dislocation and didn't have surgery tended not to miss any time. A full dislocation without surgery led to only a median of three weeks missed. Having surgery, however, led to a return to play median of 39.3 weeks. This doesn't necessarily mean they couldn't have played before that point. This paper specifically studies instability events suffered during the season, so someone who has surgery and misses the rest of the season can't play again until the following fall. Whether they're physically ready to play or not before then doesn't matter. But it certainly gets the attention when you're looking this information up to figure out what to expect from a guy who was out for five months, not nine. So I spun off that and looked up general healing and rehab times for more general shoulder labor repairs, not slap repairs. Four to six months before a full return to sports is a common assumption. As I understand it, Hakuoho wasn't doing practice bouts for too long before his return basho, so they may have more or less kept to this time frame. Keep in mind though, that just because the rehabilitation aspect is considered finished doesn't mean the shoulder is 100%. At minimum, there will be scar tissue in there that needs to break up and be reabsorbed into the body. The scar tissue can cause lack of mobility and impaired strength, and even with significant attention paid to breaking it up, that process takes a while. Furthermore, these time frames are for the general public. Sumo wrestlers not only have impact with the shoulders and arms, but they torque the shoulders pretty hard for some throws as well. Shiono Fuji may not have become one of the greatest Yokozuna of all time if he hadn't created such absurd strength in his shoulders as a way to overcome the injuries being caused by the effort going into his throws. We should expect it to take longer for a sumo wrestler, even a young strong one like Hakuoho, to truly regain full capacity after this type of surgery. The fact he said he felt okay isn't that meaningful when we're talking about a young man who's champing at the bit to get back in the ring. Of course he feels okay once the pain is gone and he can basically do what he needs to do. It doesn't mean he's anywhere near full power. If I had to TLDR this whole thing, basically it seems that they took the right approach with Wakataka Kage and he's on a good track to get as much out of his body as possible, but there's a good chance he'll never quite regain his pre-injury form. With Hakuoho, I'm crossing my fingers that he isn't going to suffer ill effects from not waiting another Basho to come back, but his injury is more likely to allow for a full return to form. We just may have to wait a while, maybe the end of the year or even longer, to really see where he's going to end up. Alright, that's our report on Wakataka Kage and Hakuoho and the likelihood of their return to the top of the sport. Since it seems like Hakuoho should make it all the way back, my question is where you think Wakataka Kage will get to on his comeback. Will he make the Sanyaku again? Will he get there and stay, or just bounce in and out? If you don't think he'll make it back, where do you think he caps out? Leave your answers in the comments, have a great day, and I'll see you soon.